I want you to imagine the following scenario. A devastating biological weapons attack has just killed 230,000 Americans. For sake of argument, let's say it occurred in Seattle. At the same time, specialized infiltration units made their way into U.S. national forests and state parks, setting forest fires in the midst of an extreme drought across much of the western United States. Those fires have forced evacuations, they've destroyed structures and habitat, and they're choking American cities with smoke and unsafe air quality. U.S. residents with chronic respiratory illnesses begin inundating U.S. hospitals. Now I want you to picture something further. Chinese, U.K., French, and Russian officials independently contact the U.S. administration with an unmistakable message that accords with the administration's own defense and intelligence community assessments. The culprit behind both was North Korea. At this point, the identity of the U.S. president would be pretty much irrelevant. I don't care if it's Dennis Kucinich or Kanye West or, hell, Adam West or Mae West or Cornell West. You can be damn sure there would be a response strategy designed to punish those actions and deter future ones. And that strategy would be backed by the most fearsome collection of military capabilities to ever exist. A huge nuclear arsenal, the world's most technologically advanced and capable military, and a vast network of allies to join in the fight. COVID and climate change are effectively mounting that kind of attack. And you missed the air quotes there because you can't see me. I just described a moment ago, with devastating effects of similar magnitude. And moreover, they're not just doing it to the United States. These attacks are global in nature. Yet from the Paris Agreement, to COVID response, to even multilateral disaster response through organizations like the Nobel Prize-winning World Food Program, which is chronically short on cash, the response has been pretty underwhelming. Why? In this lecture, we'll first outline some of the reasons why climate change, and to a lesser extent the pandemic, present unconventional security threats that challenge conventional security paradigms in terms of response strategies and the tools available to implement them. Then, we'll turn to the debate over climate impacts on more traditional security concerns like civil war, using the war in Syria as a window into that debate. Climate change threatens security, both human and state security, through a dizzying array of channels. Climate change will affect access to water, food, and energy, each of which is linked to conflict risk and national security and human security interests through different channels, as well as patterns and prevalence of infectious disease, the frequency and scale of humanitarian crises, and human migration patterns. In turn, climate change will stress existing institutions for managing transboundary resources, like rivers and fisheries, and may directly affect conflict risk between states. Climate change will also directly affect economies across the spectrum of levels of development, sunsetting some sectors of the economies while creating new ones. We're already seeing how deindustrialization and the loss of secure blue-collar jobs are affecting U.S. domestic politics. We can expect a lot of that kind of dislocation moving forward. And the situation is more complicated still. The second-order effects of attempts to mitigate climate change will have seismic effects for global energy systems. These effects will have particularly important security implications for major legacy hydrocarbon producers and countries that invested heavily in energy exploration and infrastructure during the 21st century commodity boom, which was roughly from 2002 to 2014. They will also affect countries with large exportable endowments of transition metals, like aluminum, copper, rare earths, lithium, and cobalt, that will underpin transitions to more sustainable energy systems. These risks are both numerous and poorly understood for at least four interrelated reasons. First, there's still some fundamental uncertainty about the relative conflict risk associated with climate change. Climate conflict links may operate through a variety of channels, some of which we have already kind of, you know, hinted at earlier, but only some of which have been really subjected to rigorous analysis. A recent expert elicitation exercise, which is basically a fancy way of identifying the consensus position of a panel of experts, asked conflict scholars to place climate variability and or change in context with other well-established risk factors for domestic armed conflict. This exercise concluded climate variability and or change was a less important source of conflict risk than other well-documented conflict drivers, like low socioeconomic development, low state capacity, and intergroup inequalities. And that the scientific literature on the subject was characterized by the highest degree of uncertainty. However, The most common characterization of climate conflict risk in policy discussions is as a threat multiplier. That is, 
It exacerbates existing drivers of conflict like poverty, low state capacity, intergroup inequalities, and economic shocks. This language is very prominent in U.S. national security circles, as we'll see next week. That is, climate change may exert direct effects on conflict, but likely exerts even larger indirect effects operating through other known drivers. Second, climate change does not fit very neatly into conventional security paradigms for risk mitigation or neutralization. Other emergent threats, like, say, the cyber domain or autonomous weapon systems, complicate conventional practices of deterrence and compellence, but do not necessarily obviate traditional approaches policymakers can bring to the table for trying to lessen risk. Those other tools, that cyber and drones, are typically wielded by state or non-state actors that can be influenced by traditional measures intended to affect the risk-reward calculation of potential enemies. For example, cyber complicates attribution of attacks, for sure, but ultimately the attackers can be identified and punished or deterred from future aggression. But you can't deter a flood or a drought. You might deter actors emboldened by these climate-related events, like Boko Haram, for example. People of Lake Chad are caught in a conflict trap. Violent conflict between state security forces and armed opposition groups have blighted the lives of local communities and forced 2.5 million people from their homes. Climate change is compounding these challenges. Contrary to popular beliefs, the latest research shows that Lake Chad is currently not shrinking. After the chronic droughts of the 70s and 80s, the lake is in a period of expansion. But even though the lake is not shrinking, climate change is a serious problem for the region. The population is highly affected by seasonal and interannual rainfall variability. People don't know when the rains will come, how much rain will come, or where the water of the lake will be available. The uncertainty and the interaction of climate and conflict undermine people's day-to-day -day lives and their jobs, reducing their ability to adapt to climate change. Where once they might have moved to a different location to farm or graze their animals when the rains failed, military restrictions mean that these options may no longer be available to them. This is decreasing their ability to cope with both climate change and the conflict around them. One important step to break this conflict trap is to support resilient livelihoods. For the young, growing population living around the lake, where unemployment and underemployment are endemic, the lack of jobs and money is a major strain on resilience, and indeed one of the reasons cited for people choosing to join armed opposition groups, such as Boko Haram. Resilient jobs can be achieved, for example, through new climate-resilient farming approaches to diversify rural income. Climate and conflict-sensitive livelihoods can provide young men and women with employment opportunities in the face of a changing climate. With over 10.7 million people in urgent humanitarian need, Lake Chad's conflict trap can seem insurmountable. But the lake has always been a source of resilience, and it can be again. But even if the terrorist threat is surmounted, the climate is still changing. The impacts of climate change have to be tackled as part of peace-building efforts in the region if it is to break free of the conflict trap. In doing this, Lake Chad can once again become an engine for sustainable livelihoods and stability. And there is hope for sustainable peace in the region. Those events themselves, the underlying drivers, the droughts, the lack of livelihood security, are going to still have direct effects for human security and may necessitate militarized response. And they can also generate public bads, like rapid unforeseen migration or disease outbreaks, 
or government paralysis that are independent of the conventional threats posed by non-state armed groups. Third, the pace and scale of the problem is not a good fit for existing approaches to security. We, and by we I mean humanity, are not very good at addressing slow onset calamities, or those that don't arrive as an obvious, clear, and present danger. The biggest threats posed by climate change and disease have not materialized, at least not yet, as rapid onset transfixing events like Pearl Harbor. One day after the Pearl Harbor attack, which killed roughly 2,300 U.S. service persons and 68 civilians, and which occurred before Hawaii had even achieved statehood, the United States issued a formal declaration of war against Japan, the responsible party. The entire U.S. defense community, as well as the U.S. economy and the home front, including the shape and composition of the U.S. labor force, was reformed in a matter of months and years. By 1944, the size of the U.S. economy had almost doubled, growing a staggering 84% in just four years. Both my grandfathers served in the U.S. military during that time, one as a bomber pilot and the other as a nuclear scientist, working on uranium enrichment. Heck, my grandmother had a radio show where she would give tips to homemakers about how they could grow and manage and harvest and can the harvest of their victory gardens to help conserve resources for the war effort. The United States would end that war a radically changed place, with a permanent military-industrial complex, a vast standing military and intelligence community, and the main underwriter of institutions like the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, and later the World Bank. It was an exceptional time that required, and more importantly, elicited an exceptional response. Similarly, earlier in our lifetimes, the United States has reshaped many aspects of life in response to the galvanizing 9-11 attacks, which resulted in two foreign wars, a broad global anti-terrorism campaign, and a global reshaping of travel infrastructure and the travel experience. But like other slow-onset problems ranging from the obesity epidemic to the chronic underfunding of Social Security, the danger is not really in death by a decisive blow, but rather through myriad smaller impacts that challenge the social and economic fabric of the country. Climate change is not really the wolf at the door, threatening to blow the house down. Rather, it's thousands of termites eating away at the frame, slowly, bit by bit, day after day, in unforeseen ways. But if left unattended, both are going to cause the roof to cave in. Finally, the effects of climate change on conflict may be large in the aggregate, but almost never are they the decisive causal factor, which stymies the development of mental models to guide policymakers in crafting responses. Arguing any particular conflict was caused by climate change is exceedingly difficult. Multiple motivations are almost always present among conflict participants, and these motivations are both stated and unstated. Also, contextual factors, like dependence on agriculture for livelihoods, patterns of exclusionary ethnic rule, and low levels of economic development affect whether a given climate shock, right, in the form of a drought or a flood, is going to result in violence. Most of the research on climatic conditions and conflict finds climate shocks raise the probability of a large-scale event, like, say, armed conflict onset or the outbreak of a war, occurring relative to some baseline level of risk, or increases in the frequency with which smaller-scale events, like a protest, or individual battles or skirmishes, or a cattle raid, occur. That is, climate shocks are probabilistically causal in the sense that they make something more or less likely. They are not deterministically causal in the sense that they are wholly responsible for the outcome. These probabilistic relationships emerge from the study of hundreds, if not thousands, or tens and hundreds of thousands, of cases using quantitative methods, including meta-analyses, so combining the results of 50 or 60 different studies together. That is, the evidence is stronger in the aggregate than it is in any particular case. Let me reason by example for a second. Does smoking make lung cancer more likely? Of course. This relationship has been confirmed over and over and over and over. We even understand the biology behind it now. My maternal grandfather died of lung cancer. He smoked until the age of 21. So was my grandfather's lung cancer caused by smoking? Well, probably not, or at least not mostly. After World War II, he worked in a lumber treatment facility where he was exposed to inhaling toxic chemicals for most of his adult life. That is, other factors were probably more important in explaining the outcome, even if the quote-unquote causal factor was present and may have been a contributing factor, in this case the causal factor being smoking. Now this brings us to thinking about Syria. 
This ongoing conflict has so far claimed nearly 600,000 lives and created nearly 11 million refugees and internally displaced persons. However, the role of environmental factors in that conflict is still pretty hotly contested. Some view it as a climate-caused conflict. Others think climate change and drought had relatively little to do with the outbreak of violence. Thus, by looking into this case study, we can present three different perspectives on the causes of this armed conflict. The first is kind of the Malthusian, or we could say the environmental determinist narrative. The second is a revisionist narrative, which counters that the case for environmental causes is pretty overblown. And finally, what I would argue for, which is a synthetic perspective that attempts to bridge the differences between the two. In doing so, it highlights how environmental factors can be important in creating grievances, but focuses our attention also on the contextual factors and the importance of government policy responses that determine whether these grievances will result in conflict. So let's start with the Malthusian perspective. Now, you hadn't thought I'd forgotten about our pal Tommy Malthus, had you? In 2011, Syria was not really considered a likely candidate for falling into civil conflict. The country had just experienced nearly 30 years of political instability, albeit pretty brutally imposed, under the al-Assad dynasty, with power transferring to Bashar al-Assad from his father, Hafez, who died in 2000. Though the country is predominantly Sunni Muslim, the al-Assad family is Alawite, an offshoot of Islam that considers itself a separate religion. Now, Syria is comparatively poor, with a GDP per capita ranging from about $725 to roughly, you know, about $2,000 between 1994 and 2007, though it had been experiencing a pretty significant economic surge in the last five or six years preceding the onset of the war. Syria had been considered a very militarily capable state and had a really vast kind of security apparatus used largely to squelch domestic protest and jail political dissidents. Though Syria was much less agriculturally dependent than most states in sub-Saharan Africa or South Asia, 50% of the population still lived in rural areas. From 2006 to 2011, Syria experienced one of the worst long-term droughts in the history of the Fertile Crescent, with climate scientists calling it the worst in the instrumental record. That's a pretty long time at this point. Further analysis would link that drought to climate change, arguing that climate change has made this kind of extreme drought much more likely than it used to be. Particularly agriculturally dependent regions like Hasake in the north saw 75% of their crops fail and herders lose 85% of their livestock. These losses left approximately 1 to 1.3 million Syrians food insecure and made their rural livelihoods pretty unsustainable. Fleeing that drought-imposed hardship more than 1.5 million people, mostly agricultural workers and family farmers, moved from rural areas to cities and slums and camps in and around Syria's major cities. Aleppo, Damascus, which is the capital, Dara'a, Dei El Zur, Hama, and Homs. Many of these migrants were young men accustomed to farm work who had found their employment prospects dim in these urban centers. If you're used to you know, pulling weeds or plowing fields, you're going to have a rough transition to office work or you know, potentially driving a taxi. Successful farmers and farmhands became unskilled, lowly paid laborers or unemployed almost overnight. This mass rapid migration placed significant strain on these urban centers, especially as food prices skyrocketed across the Middle East and North Africa. Taking cues from the Arab Spring uprisings in neighboring countries and angered by spiraling food prices related to Russia's drought and wildfires, some of these young men and women began protesting the al-Assad regime demanding the release of political prisoners in March 2011. These demonstrations began peacefully, but escalated to violent clashes as the security forces responded in a very heavy-handed manner. By July of 2011, these clashes had erupted into a full-blown insurgency. The fighting continues as of now, having drawn in ISIS rebels as well as the United States, Russia, and Turkey, among others. The massive refugee crisis created by this conflict strains both neighboring countries and relations with the European Union. To this day. Now, in this narrative, the causal chain linking climate change to conflict is relatively straightforward. Climate change results in a historic drought, which leads to crop and livestock failure, which leads to rural hardship and migration to urban centers, which leads to dissatisfaction with the government and employment prospects, which leads to protest and violent repression, which leads to dissidents taking up arms. That's how you get from point A to point B. Now, this perspective has become pretty dominant in policy circles, with figures like then-President Barack Obama and then-Secretary of State John Kerry linking the Syrian civil war to climate change. 
President Obama said climate change-related drought helped fuel the early unrest in Syria, which descended into civil war. While Secretary Kerry noted, it's not a coincidence that immediately prior to the civil war in Syria, the country experienced its worst drought on record. Now, in contrast to all of this, the revisionist narrative of the Syrian civil war places very little emphasis on climatic conditions. Rather, it explains the conflict's onset by pointing to factors like authoritarian rule, political marginalization, and the removal of subsidies that had served to prop up the rural economy. To explain the specific timing, this account looks to the demonstration effect of young Syrians seeking to follow fellow Arabs across the Middle East, protesting authoritarian rule across the region. The revisionist narrative points also to some pretty weak links in the causal chain outlined earlier, or at least weak according to them. First, the revisionist narrative does not deny the historic magnitude of the drought for the Fertile Crescent as a whole, but it does counter that the meteorological data is not clear-cut on the magnitude of the drought for Syria in particular, and that data from many Syrian weather stations do not demonstrate a drying trend over the latter half of the 20th century. That is, climate change does not appear to be making northern Syria, the area most affected by the drought, more arid and more drought-prone. Under this interpretation, Climate change did not make the drought worse or more likely to have occurred in the first place. Second, the revisionist narrative counters that drought was not the main cause of crop failures that made rural life pretty intolerable. Drought certainly affected crop yields, or the amount of crop harvested from a given piece of land in a season, but it's not really the only factor. For one thing, irrigation can break that relationship. And since some of the land in that particular region is irrigated, it's not entirely dependent on good rains for good harvests. Instead, the revisionist narrative would counter that crops failed due to severe late-season frost, and more importantly, removals of subsidies are on inputs like fertilizer and water that effectively tripled farmers' costs overnight. That is, crops failed not because of a drought, per se, but because of misguided policy changes and a late-season freeze that had nothing to do with the drought itself. Finally, the revisionist narrative doubts the importance of drought-related grievances and drought-affected participants to the initial uprising. For example, protesters in Dara'a presented 13 demands to the local administration in March 2011. None of them had anything to do with drought or drought relief. Rather, they focused on issues like security sector reform, removal of the town governor, reinstatement of women teachers who were expelled for wearing the niqab, which is a face-covering veil, and lowering fuel prices. Additionally, there's little evidence to indicate that displaced rural dwellers were active in organizing or attending the protests. In Dara'a, recent migrants neither participated in protests in large numbers nor were targeted for arrests or beatings. Once the protests began, many fled the city to avoid being caught up in the conflict. Thus, the link between environmental grievances and protest activity is somewhat suspect. The revisionist take looks elsewhere than the environment to explain why Syrians were angry with their government and points to long-standing issues like authoritarian rule, human rights abuses, exclusionary patronage networks built around religious identity, i.e. high groupness and neopatrimonialism, and proximate sparks like surging food and fuel prices and the demonstration effect of Arab Spring uprisings in neighboring countries. If everyone was doing it, why couldn't they? If not then, then when? Okay, so having looked at the Malthusian and the revisionist perspectives, How can we reconcile these two? One puts environmental factors front and center. The other barely assigns them any weight at all. Now first, we should note that to claim any particular conflict was caused by climate change is exceedingly difficult, as we discussed earlier in the lecture. Dissidents almost always have multiple motivations, like revenge, or greed, or ideology, or religion. And these motivations are both stated, i.e. people talk about them, and unstated, people don't. Second, as we know, Contextual factors, like dependence on agriculture for livelihoods, patterns of exclusionary ethnic rule, and low levels of economic development affect whether a given climate shock, like a drought or a flood, is going to result in violence. That historic drought that affected Syria also affected neighboring Jordan and Lebanon and Cyprus. Yet we didn't see any widespread violence in any of those places, did we? Even if and when climate matters, it matters in a specific political, social, and economic context that really needs to be taken into account. Additionally, we should probably note that whatever the cause of crop failure, could have been drought, frost, or subsidy removals, its impact was much larger in a more agriculturally dependent country like Syria than it would have been in an OECD country, where fewer than two or three people in 100 are farmers. 
renewable resources and access to them and viability of them are still a central part of the story linking declining rural livelihoods to surging urban populations. But these declining rural livelihoods are obviously more important some places than they are others. Finally, I think that this case points out the importance of choice and agency. In times of crisis, governments can use policy levers to ease the pain associated with environmental or market-based shocks, or they can choose not to. Facing rising discontent in urban centers, the Syrian government chose to respond the way most authoritarian governments do, by cutting back on social services for rural dwellers and attempting to concentrate benefits on urban ones. The strategy really ultimately backfired. It caused urban migration and created a problem that didn't exist in the first place. And it heightened grievances in rural areas and encouraged those people to ultimately voice those grievances in their new arrival destinations and cities. Okay, so based on all of this, did climate change actually cause the Syrian civil war? We'll discuss that more in class.